Okay, um, so I guess I'm here as the, the token engineer. Um, actually, firstly, I, I should be grateful for those of you who made it, managed to make it up this, make it this morning. I hear the party went on quite late. So uh, thank you for that. Um, actually, show of hands, how many people here are, shall we say, product side? Product people? Yeah. Um, I don't know, UX? Or usability, front end? Yeah. Testing? One. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, development? Whoa. So I guess the, I guess the other people are the, the product and UX people are, are, are better at parties. Um, I guess and, and my job is to try and make them jealous they didn't turn up. Um, there are, yeah, as, as I was saying, that, that um, this is a sort of a recasting of a, a talk I normally do, um, for a, perhaps for a more general audience. There are two small examples of code. The rest of the talk is safe, because <laughs> um, so, I took out a lot of the, uh, a lot of the other stuff. Um, just going back to Chris Matt's talk, because I had a little call with him yesterday. Um, his line was that pretty much everything was stable. You know, a lot of the work had been done at the team level. I think there's still things to do. Um, in, we've, still, we've, we've made a lot of progress in getting the development side to be aware of uh, the business and the, the product side, if you like, to, to care more about it. Um, from my selfish point of view, I think there's more work to be done in the other direction. Um, and I'll come back to this a few times. Um, because the whole, if you get the whole loop going, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Um, and the other thing that many organizations forget is that the team itself is a stakeholder in the system. It's not just the business and the customers. The team is a stakeholder. And I picked test driven development because that's what I usually talk about. It's something uh, that works for me. Um, and we're now in this situation where test driven development is, has become so successful that it's unfashionable. Um, but I think there's more to do, and I think it's not just about coding, and I want to explain why. But first, a bit of context. Um, by the way, if you can't, if I'm not clear at the back, let me know, because it's, sometimes it's difficult to tell. Um, yeah, so like every, every idea, test-driven development has gone through, you know, the pioneering, the hype, the exploitation, and the backlash, and now everyone's going test-driven, you know, okay, whatever. Um, but within that history, I think there are fundamentals that are easy to lose sight of and worth revisiting. And like a lot of simple ideas, there are subtleties that are in practice that, are, that take a little time to understand. Um, but we have, it's important to remember, we've come a long way. Uh, first version of this talk I did, that had a, was a 10-year cake. Now we're on 15 years. Um, and testing was traditionally this low-status occupation trapped at the end of the process, that usually got squashed or squeezed out when inevitably the project ran late. Uh, and the real stars were developers who built frameworks for lesser developers to build the systems. Um, that was also a time when we drove without seat belts and we used to smoke indoors. Um, nowadays, of course, everybody takes testing seriously. Um, some developers have been concerned as to whether their designs are testable, and a smaller number even do something about it. But there is a problem. Not everyone agrees with this. Uh, many people find that they have a shadow code base that has, doesn't help them understand the code, has never caught an interesting bug, and every time they try and, and it inhibits ref refactoring because every time they try and change anything, all the tests break. Um, no wonder it's got a bad name. And then there's a few years ago, there was all this test driven is dead, you know, blah, 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 um, which I still don't believe. Um, maybe test driven development doesn't apply everywhere, but anyway. But I don't, more to the point is I don't think it has to be like this. Um, Good. There's an interesting term. There's, a, there's this very famous person in computer security called Bruce Schneider, Schneier, who came up with this term called security theater. It's the kind of security you do to make people feel better that doesn't actually improve security. It's like putting a big lock 
on the front of a tent. Um, and his claim is that a lot of what passes as computer security or airport security, for example, is, comes under this, this sort of... Um, is more about show than, than practice. And I think what we're seeing is a certain amount of test-driven theatre, which is we're trying to, you know, people are trying to do their best, but to some extent they haven't quite understood all, all the substance of it. Um, and they end up with horrible messes because it isn't actually working. Um, and I think we should all care about this because uh, apart from the fact it wastes time and money, um, it also makes people miserable because it's not, it's, it's not very pleasant uh, working in this sort of environment. I think also, over the years, we made a bigger mistake. Uh, we, we, we let the idea pass that test and development was really only for programmers, you know, and even a small part of that, um, rather than uh, thinking about it as a way of making progress. Um, incidentally, this is a um, photo of uh, Thompson and Ritchie, the, the two people who built Unix, the first Unix. I think you can boil, loosely boil test-driven development down to three statements. Let's be clear about what we ha want to happen next and figure out, a, figure out a way for us to tell when we've done it. And this is the sort of the attitude of, of you know, how can we tell if it works, which, which um, is used, it drives a lot of things. Um, and let's do this in small steps to minimise the risk. Um, iterative growth is a fundamental to... I mean, it goes together with, with test-driven. Um, at the time it was starting, this was only really common in a couple of uh, cultures like Smalltalk and Lisp. Um, although there's this massive, less sustainable version, if you think about it, with things like Visual Basic and spreadsheets and stuff. Now it's, it's a lot more common, but it's not... We haven't entirely won the battle. I still see organisations that are trying to develop from documents. I'll come back to this. And then this is the one that, that tends to get left out. And let's use that experience to keep improving the system uh, with all this talk of testing. Uh, it's this bit about listening to and responding to uh, the feedback from the system and how people use it. And I'll come back to this too. This is the bit that tends not to happen with in the Visual Basic world and, and equivalents. So, just to make sure we haven't forgotten and that we're all on the same page, let's go over the basics again. This is the loop, is the core of test-driven development. Um, you first write down the result of the next change you want to see. This is your analysis moment. It's, how you get to, it's when you just get to decide what's the next piece of functionality, um, how am I going to trigger it, and how, how am I going to see that it's, it's happened. Um, in code, that might be an interface. You could argue at other levels it might be defined in terms of the user experience or even the money. Who knows? Um, the second step is to get the code to pass, uh, get the test to pass as, as, in a sort of simple and brutal and direct manner. Um, at this point, we're just trying to make sure that we've we've understood it and we've got everything, we've got that functionally locked down, functionality locked down. And the third step, which everyone ten, tends to get. Um, lost a bit, is to step back and look for patterns um, and duplication to understand, so, to, so that we better understand the domain and the implementation and we can improve it uh, more clearly. And in code, this is your design moment. This is where you see the duplication and you go, ah, there's a concept in there, I'm going to pull that out. Um, at other levels, we might, know, we might notice a clumsy process flow and we could improve that. Um, and the reason I think this is important to everybody is that, to me, the tests are a bridge between a need and its fulfillment. That's why I like to write the test first, because it helps me think about what I actually want. Um, it forces me to check my understanding before jumping in into the implementation. Um, so the way I tend to work is I'm very careful about naming the test before I fill it in, because I use that as uh, my... My view is that if I can't come up with a good test name, I haven't quite teased out what's important. Um, and then within the body of the test, you want to make it readable so that you can come back to it and you understand what the point, what, you know, what it is that this thing is supposed to be, be uh, expressing. Um, and the other thing you find with this is that finding a good representation is very important 
because if you find the right representation, it highlights what's missing and what's important. Um, the only way I know how to do this is through close collaboration uh, between all the roles on the team. The developers, are good at, uh, developers tend to be good at abstraction and structure, but obviously in most cases, other people are better at the domain and the business. Um, but we need the skills from both sides, from all sides rather, to produce meaningful and resilient tests. Um, there's a common practice these days that I see of turning what was your test organization into test script writers. Um, I've come to view that as an anti-pattern um, because it turns into another handoff. Is that, you know, the business talks to the test writers, the test writers talk to the, pass something on to the developers and the developers fill it in. I'll come back to this. But unless you have extraordinarily good test people writing tests or extraordinarily bad developers, um, you missed an opportunity to construct a, a better domain model together. So let's have a little example of that. This is one of two slides of code, so hang on, it'll be safe. Whoops, lost it again, there we go. So this is a little JUnit test. Um, I don't think you have to be a coder to understand this, I'll just walk it through. I think this is a bad test. I wrote it, it's my fault. Um, there's a number of things about this. One is, if you can see, there's this clever bit of going around the back breaking encapsulation, so you can see what's inside. That's a clue. Um, it's got a name that doesn't really tell me anything very interesting. I'm adding something into a basket, so what? What's that? What use is that to the world? Um, so it's not explanatory, and it doesn't really tell me what matters about this. It just tells me that I can call this method, and then I've called it. Um, my, preferred, my preference is uh, I still use a style called test docs that was first written up by uh, Chris Stevenson. And the idea is you take the thing under test and treat it as the subject of a sentence. So tell me about a basket. Well, a basket's empty when it's created. And a basket returns items in the order they were added. Oh, let's look at that test. There's a basket. I had a pen and an ink and a paper. And then when I get them back, they come back in the same order. Oh, OK. I can read that. Uh, what else? It totals up the cost of its items. It fails when, you know, you get the drift. Um, I believe that even if you're not a coder, you could sort of, you could be walked through this and still understand the point. So imagine a world where you have this tight, you know, in, highly integrated team. Everyone's working together. You've got a question, and you can take someone from the business side, point them at the code, and go, you see this? What, what do you think should happen here? Um, that's quite powerful if you do it right. Uh, the other thing, the next thing to talk about is um, that part of this is the reason I use this stuff is quality. And I'll walk through this in a minute. I think everybody on the team should care about code quality. The promise we make with iterative development is that the team can follow the product wherever we go, wherever it needs to go. That's why we don't do lockdown planning and design, because, partly because we know it will change and we will get it wrong. Um, but also so that, so that you know, as circumstances happen, you know, as we discover more, we can, we, can follow, we, f we can follow. But it's important to remember that the other side of that deal is that we have to keep the system, the code in the system, uh, flexible. So we don't get stuck when that change arrives. Um, and for me, I use test-driven development as part of that, as a technique for, for doing that. And one of the ways of thinking about this is there's two sort of axes of quality, two basic types of quality. One is um, external quality. So does the system do what you need? Does, will it, can you add it, can you buy, put stuff in the, back, in the shopping cart and buy it and take it home and all the rest of it? The fundamental stuff. Um, from a an outside point of view, can you support it? Does, it? does it go fast enough? Does it fall over? Those are all things, that, that's what you might call the external quality. And the way you exercise that, usually, is with system level tests, um, or acceptance tests, or end-to-end -end tests, but larger scale tests, because you're testing the system as a whole. Um, but the thing about, and a lot of people like to test just at that level, which is fair enough, but that doesn't tell you about what's going on inside. Um, what that doesn't tell you is 
about the internal quality. And the internal quality is, is this a system you can live with? Is, is this a system when, when a change happens, you can make that change safely without um, everything falling to pieces every time you try and release? Um, and that does happen. I know of a system I, I worked with where they got stuck. They couldn't release for two months because they lost control of the code. And that, that was quite embarrassing, especially as they were being hacked at the time. Um, and to me, that's the level of the internal you know, unit tests, small-scale small, small scale tests. Um, and there's a colleague of mine, Nigel Ronalds Moss, who put it this way, is that if you think about external quality, external quality is about the present. Where are we now? And maybe the past, what have we achieved so far? Whereas internal quality is about the future. What can we do in the future? And I use, like I say, I use particularly test-driven development for internal quality, although it has aspects at, at, at the larger scale, because it encourages me to keep my code clean and modular. And it also helps, in particular, it helps me uh, avoid writing features that I don't actually need. I'll come back to that a few times. And this matters to people on the product side because um, it's risk management. So in many cases that I've seen, although everybody would like more features for the money, including developers, in a lot of cases what you actually want is some degree of predictability. And in some cases that's more important than you know, more better features. Um, and it's very unsettling when a project that's been ticking over nicely, uh, just, just moving along, suddenly grinds to a halt because the team of the development side has lost control of the code base. And when, when delivery suddenly becomes unpredictably unpredictable, you know, your unknown unknowns, um, that's, that gets painful, that gets quite uncomfortable. Um, but to be clear, that's not the same as, I don't know how long this is going to take because we've never done it before. This is, we thought we had this under control, we thought we knew what we were doing, it turns out we don't. And that, that's when things get painful. And the other reason you need to think about life, uh, you should think about internal quality is if you, you need to look at the whole life cycle. And again, you see organizations where they're obsessed with velocity, must go fast, you know, more velocity, more points, more points. But they're not looking at the next stage after that. Because of course you can get more points, you know, even without gaming the point system. Um, but ticking off stories as fast as possible is not the most effective thing you do if the, next res if the end result is you spend all your time fixing the bugs in production. Or you have to build a support team. Or your customers walk away because the thing just doesn't work. Um, you have to look at the whole thing. And the, the point of the internal quality is you're trying to stop the failures getting into the system in the first place. Because then you don't have to deal with them. And on that note, this is a frontispiece to Utopia. Um, it is actually possible to have code bases with no significant bugs. Um, I've done it a few times over the years when the planets line up in the right direction. Um, it takes effort and skill, but it's not impossible. Um, particularly the sort of applications I get to work in, and I suspect most of the people here. If you look at the whole continuous delivery movement, it's based on the notion that we can get this to work. We don't have to go through a um, terrifying, um, hardening uh, period at the end. If you can get there, the great thing is it opens up new ways of working that, because you don't have to spend all your time uh, mitigating against it, possible errors. It really does change the world. You change what you need to build and change uh, uh, the way, the way you, you, you work. It's, and if you can get to this confidence, you can just get on with things. It's such a relief rather than sort of being trapped in impact analysis and fear. And there's a system I worked on where the original spec was full of configurability and stuff because their working assumption was that making a change to the system was terribly dangerous and difficult. And so they had to make it configurable, which of course makes the system more difficult and more dangerous. And we got to the point where we could just release any, you want to release, it's released. Um, and that, whoops, which took out the need for a whole bunch of complexity in the system. So, Let's pretend for a moment that we believe in this stuff. Um, what would the test be for test-driven development? What, what, what would it feel like? I'm talking about this from my point of view, which is as a developer. But I think if you're not a developer, if you can 
think about how this would apply to you. Um, so one thing is steady incremental progress. Uh, you add a feature at a time, each step either adds functionality or improves the design. You're not constantly reworking tests. There's no debug hell. My f worst bug was multi-threaded C++. It took me three weeks to find. I never want to go there again. Uh, has anyone else had one of those? No. Yeah, don't do it. It's <laughs> um, and it's one of the things that Ward Cunningham, who's the, the source of a lot of this, these ideas, pointed out about, about XP, is it doesn't feel very fast when you're doing it, because you're being very careful. But it's relentless. It just keeps moving. It doesn't get stuck. Um, I think there's an unappreciated benefit in that we're always being... Um, we're always constantly succeeding. We're only this far from success. Uh, never that far from a green bar. If you're feeling a bit miserable, you can run the test a couple of times, and yeah, it's still working. That's great. Um, you avoid the emotional costs of what, what I call sort of boom and bust programming. You know, you put the headphones on, and you code away all night, and it's great. You know, and, you come, and then when you finally get back into work the next day, you then have two weeks of debugging and thing because you've lost control. Um, which is just miserable. I remember one of the first XP teams I was on. We had one, one guy who was just not interested. So we found him a special project. And um, I remember looking out over at him a, little bit, you know, a couple of weeks later. And he was there slumped in his chair trying to find the bug because you know, he'd got a memory smash or something. And it's like, I haven't done that in a while. Isn't it nice? Um, I think before I act, I have to declare what my intentions are before I start thinking about the implementation. And I have to do this from the point of view of the client, from the caller. Um, and I find constantly this, this, this helps drive out my assumptions. It's that the act of writing the test always raises stuff that I hadn't really thought of. Um, and this kind of gets lost in all this talk about test frameworks and development techniques and whatever. Um, but when this is working really well, I go... What are we doing again? And then we have to go up and talk to somebody. And that's your, one of those special moments, which I'll come back to. This is more of a sort of techie thing, which is things break when they're supposed to. Um, when I change production or test code, then the right things break. One of the failure modes that you see with, with, with some test-driven test code bases is you make a little change and everything goes bang. And they go, oh, this doesn't work. No, actually, the tests are doing their job. They're showing you that you have dependencies that shouldn't be there. You have modularized enough, either in the test or the code or something else. Is that you still have work to do on your design, and you should be listening to your tests rather than stepping on them. And finally, in this one, this is the this is one of the, the nicer things is that you get surprising de designs emerge. Um, it took me a long time, um, but at least in terms of code, I've sort of. Really, learn to relax my need, need for control and just let follow the code rather than trying to push it. And I find this regularly produces better, usually simpler designs than the one I had in my head. And part of this is about learning to wait for evidence that a structure is relevant rather than coding it up speculatively. Um, and one of the nice things about this is sometimes you be working on some tests and you refactor it a bit to make it easier to read or to remove some, remove some duplication, and you come up with a, with a new concept. And sometimes that concept, quite often that concept, will drift into the production code because it's useful. On a particularly good day, um, it will drift back into the business because you're going, oh, and we highlighted this, con you know, we were looking at this, and we think that these, these things are all mixed up and actually, actually these three different concepts instead. And just very occasionally, you'll find that actually it will open up new areas of business because you've been, suddenly become clearer about what you're actually doing. That's rare, but it's very nice when it happens. So I want to think about briefly about the under, my understanding of the underlying principles on the grounds that if we understand those, we stand a better chance of making it work. Uh, it's very focused. One thing at a time, reliably. Again, either add functionality or improve the code. Every time I try and do both at the same time, I get lost and have to roll back. Um, and again, making me stop and think about what I need, not the solution I, I absolutely know I need, I just know. 
And part of this is, is programmers are experts in implementation. That's what we're good at. And so we're thinking, you know, yeah, we could do this, we could do this. And oftentimes we don't need it. And it's this notion of, in combination with it, the, you aren't going to need it, is stepping back and thinking about what we actually need, which is really useful. Just, just stop people rushing ahead. Um, it's also, incidentally, a really good way of reducing cognitive load. So you, only, you don't have to think about the whole system in your head. That's one of the reasons you have to get the, into the zone, is there's too much to think about. So you can narrow your focus. And incidentally, a long time ago, I was reading this paper about uh, a piece about adult attention deficit disorder and the coping strategies. And I'm reading all this and going, that's XP. So maybe that's what, we, what our real problem is. We can't, we, attention deficit. But on, on this note, the, the, this is a, an exchange I had once with Kent Beck. And there's a story about how um, he got into this because he read in a book from the 50s about how people used to they type in the results they wanted on paper tape and they punch it in and then they'd run the, run the job and then hold the tape up and see if all the holes are locked. Does everybody know what paper tape is for? I'm getting to the point where... Does everybody remember floppy disks? <laughs> it feels like that sometimes. Uh, kids don't. Um, CDs? Anyway, um, so he tried it and it worked. But the interesting bit was this bit where I was finally able to separate logical from physical design. I'd always been told to do that, but no one ever explained how. You think of the test as the logical design, think of the code as the physical design. Take that idea and spread it out throughout the whole team. I think it works because it's concrete. People are better at thinking in terms of examples than abstractions. I think one thing we forget is how weird computational thinking is. We're just used to it but most people aren't. And there's this you know, tradition in, in Western thought, going back to Plato, of you know, there's an ideal thing, and then the things that are kind of like it, or represent it. So there's an ideal table, and all other tables are related to this ideal table. But actually, we're pattern matchers. You don't teach kids new words by saying, here's an ideal, this is a description of an ideal table. Is this a table? What you do is say, table, 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 oh yeah, and eventually they get the idea, usually quite quickly. Um, and in software, for the kind of work I mostly do, which is not that algorithmic, um, I find ex working with examples safer and easier. So here's another table. You don't have to read it, but uh, I'll look at it. This is uh, using a thing called FIT, which was another Wall Cunningham special, which interprets... <laughs> web pages, and the idea is this is a way of communicating with your users, and we actually did that on this project. Um, so this is, this is data for bonds, or financial instruments. On the left-hand side, you have the inputs. On the right-hand side, you have the outputs, and the, the little uh, framework that will compare the two and mark up the output. And in this case, it's all green, so we're ahead. But the thing about this is you can take this to, an in, to a business specialist and go... Yeah, this, these are all the conditions for Japanese bonds and things. And they go, yeah, but you've forgotten the one where they were on Tuesdays and, and, and you know, every other month we, there's that special kind of bond. Oh, yeah, let's put that in and try it out. Because people see that and it triggers them, makes them, helps them think about things. And this is one of the things about getting the right representation is that it makes it easier for people to see. This took a lot of work. Um, this was done by the developers. There was no test organization in the middle, but developers and BAs. And eventually, about after two or three months of just doing this, the BAs picked it up, because they just spent three months writing a conventional document spec. And we knew we cracked it when we got a new BA, and he looked at these pages, no, 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 no. Went back to the spec, you know, the system shall be usable and flexible, and the party shall be, as they, you know. And he went, came back to us. And he would use this, and the great thing about this is you could take one of these pages, show it to an end user, and they could see what was going on. Um, and it took a lot of work, but it was extremely powerful. And finally, in this part, is the reason I think test-driven works is it's empirical. It's full of questions like, does this work? How would I know if this worked? Um, it's full of these feedback loops. If we go back to the core loop, um, there's the loop of, the little loop of, write a failing test, watch it pass. There's a little loop, there's a loop around that of 
trying to write a test and realize you don't quite understand the problem, so you have to go and talk to somebody. Another feedback loop. There's a loop around that of we're trying to decide this requirement. We realize, actually, we don't know why we're doing this in the first place. Um, we need to have a little discussion about that, and so on. And down at the code level, there's the loop of trying to write a test, and the code is in the wrong shape, so you need to refactor before you can write the test. A lot of people forget that. And then the other one about waiting for the duplication to appear before extracting structure, rather than just jamming in the patterns, because you need patterns. Um, this is still a good book. Um, and you see lots and lots of code where people are following patterns because they're supposed to, rather than um, because it's actually, it's actually needed. OK. So I think, ooh, shouldn't have shown you that. Um, so <laughs> I'm not used to this. It's not my clicker. Um, so this is all great. So it's all fantastic. We want one of these. How do we get in? What's the entry ticket? How much do you have to pay to get into, the, into this? Um, I think there's a couple of things. One is it's a technical discipline. And technical disciplines usually take effort to learn and skill to apply. Um, there's a lot you can do just on, your, on the lower slopes, if you like. You can just writing tests at all. I mean, it, it's, it's great, actually, in those 15 years that, that the, the notion of actually writing tests is no longer exotic as compared to how it used to be. Um, that's a good start. It gives you a level of checking. Um, but uh, there's always more benefit from learning the practice more deeply. Um, there's the raw effort in learning to apply the necessary skills. And that's really not about learning to navigate the latest test framework. It's about mostly about gaining the design experience um, so that you can understand and respond to uh, what you're learning from the act of writing tests. Um, and then more, the next level up or down more deeply is the shift in attitude from what can I build to what do I need? I'm just going to build the thing that I need. And learning to drive development empirically um, from the next visible effort I want to see, effect I want to see, or from spotting repetition in the code that, that could be extracted. Um, I think about this. So I've had a sort of major shift in technique, I've said, let's say every 10 years or so. You know, procedural objects, so that lot, I think. Then objects to test driven. And I think that's about the same distance. I guess the next one is functional or something. You know, there's, there's always another one on the way. Um, and in each case, you see there's a lot of people who are, you know, if that's the range, a lot of people who are this far. And it's better than being here, but it could be over here. Um, and part of it is just having the right, being lucky enough to have the right experience and meet the right people. But also to push, to keep pushing. Actually, uh, one of the things I... One of the lines I like to use sometimes is, is when you're learning something new, you have to go too far. You have to overdo it. Because if you haven't under, overdone it, you don't know where the real limit is. You, you don't know where the boundaries are. And most people stop short. Oh, incidentally, this is the, the back of that picture. Since I think this is during the first war. So re rewards for improved methods. So here we are 100 years later, still working on it. Um, the other thing that you need to do is think about the relationship between all the different parties in the, in the team, particularly between development and what I call product. Uh, when it's working well, it changes that relationship. When it's, there is an agile failure mode, which particularly sort of you get from the consultancies, uh, but I've seen a lot of, where it turns into this feature factory. Um, you know, and at one end, you have the, the product people who come with ideas, and they hand them to the test script writers who write test scripts, who pass them off to the developers who just, you know, just shut up and implement it, if you don't mind. You might get a little discussion about the detail. You get your, your what's it, um, three amigos and all the rest of it, so, so you get discussion about the detail, but you never get to discuss why we're we doing this in the first place, because that's not your place. Um, and I think that's missing something, because there is a level up where a request for a feature just turns into a discussion about what it means and what it's for not least of which is to make sure that the people who are actually typing in the code understand what, they're trying to, what everybody is trying to achieve. Um, and sometimes that, again, that can be triggered by the actor trying to write the test code. Um, 
Now, in some organizations, these discussions can be difficult, either physically, because people are remote, and you have scratchy, not very, not very good phone lines, and you spend, you spend half your life shouting at the phone. Um, or contrary, because people are supposed to stick to their roles. I have two stories. One, I know of a technical leader in a bank who got put on a disciplinary warning because he actually did the numbers and pointed out to the product, to the business people that they were investing in the wrong things. Bad move. Even though it was based on numbers. The other one I can think of is, a, um, again, another tech lead who got into a huge stand-up row with his um, salespeople because he wanted them to put estimates for revenue on to go with the estimates for effort. And they wouldn't do it. And again, he was right on the numbers and wrong on the politics. Um, he's right on the numbers because they were losing money on most of the things they asked for. He's wrong on the politics because they were all friends with the founder. So he lost that one. So tread carefully. But the point being is, if you do that well, good things can happen. And it is true that developers do tend to assume that we know everything, we can do everything, um, which is isn't, it's quite often not true. Uh, but it's also true that developers often have unusual analytic skills that you, have, that you don't, if you don't tap into those, you're losing something. The other thing you need is a certain tolerance for uncertainty. Um, we might have a good sense of where we're going generally, uh, but there's so much detail along the way that, that we're always going to be taken somewhere unexpected. Um, we need to have confidence in our own abilities to, to you know, Set a, direction and set a direction and find our way, even when we can't see it, um, rather than needing complete approval before starting. There's still lots of organizations that have this, um, you know, the gating process where you have to have more and more stuff, and that just kills all sorts of, all sorts of possible innovation. Um, this is very hard to do across a contract boundary. So again, if you're, if you're outsourced, that gets difficult. Um, but my story, again, is, is that the thing, the contra, uh, project with the fit page, uh, by the time the developers turned up, the analysts had just spent three months, maybe longer, actually, uh, coming up with a database schema. And they checked with everybody and you know, got a big document, everybody signed off, right? And so what we did, because we didn't want to just paste that in, what we did is we would pull in features from this database schema as we needed them. So the, what was in our code was stuff that was used. There was nothing that we didn't use. And of course, we're, two, we're like a month, six weeks in, two months maybe, and it starts to fall to pieces. Because when you actually get your hands dirty, you discover things that you, you, you didn't know when you were um, when you're sort of trying to think about the problem. And we went off in a completely different direction. And it worked. If we'd stuck, to the, if stuck the schema in, we would have been in the wrong place. I'm going a little bit over because we are about started 20 minutes late, but I'll try and keep it not too much later because I know coffee is important. And in here, for in fact, perfect. Um, test driven, I find it challenging physically, uh, particularly when combined with pairing because uh, you're in this constant discussion and clarification. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And to me, it's like taking two hard exams every day, which is why I can't do more than a couple, sort of two and a half, three hour session, a couple of those a day. Um, it's just physically, physically, with a break in the middle. It just physically doesn't work. Um, and I know I'm working properly when I get to lunchtime and you know, I look at the sandwiches and I go, ah. Oh. Because I've used up all my decision making for the, for the morning. You know. <laughs> um, it's good if you can get someone else to do that for you. That doesn't combine well with cultures where time is important, where people measure the time rather than input. Um, but I think it's more productive. Of course, in many organizations, you have so many meetings that your biggest, that too much programming is not your biggest problem. Anyway. Um, and so I think there's a couple of deeper points that have been lost in all this noise about this driven development, that driven development, whatever. Um, one is, to me, there should be a continuum of experience, experience from this tiny... So this is the, your tiny little test-driven loop, as generally talked about. Um, but to me, there should be a continuum of experience all the way across, from the purpose of the business down to individual lines of code. Um, because when you, get, when you break those boundaries, um, 
that's where the, the mismatch happens and things, things get diff brittle. The other part of that is that we learn, about, um, we learn about a domain from trying to implement it. It's like the database story. Um, and what do you do with that learning? Most of, in lots of places, that just, that just stays in the development organization or it evaporates until next time. But actually, you can push that back up. Um, you can, that's, that's, that's valuable information that, that should be, or valuable understanding that should be passed through the organization. And this is very similar to the sort of story that, that like domain-driven development talks about, uh, and, and at this universal language, or ubiquitous language, rather. So I think just to, to finish up, to me, test-driven development matters because the act of writing tests, it's not the test that matters, they, I mean, the tests are useful, but it's the act of writing the test that matters because it's a bridge between deciding what you need and how you get there at all levels. If you, I don't know if Chris talked about, yesterday, talked about his whole, um, this whole thing about breaking the model on the analysis side. It's, it's, it all fits together nicely with that. Um, it validates our assumptions, both in terms of what to do next and making sure that we don't break what we already have. That's our external quality, if you like. And then it shows us where to put the boundaries. Um, both in terms of controlling scope and internally in the code in encouraging um, good modularity. And that's our internal quality. So just to finish, there's a, there's a story from, I think it was my second XP project. Uh, a little bit after I left, the story goes that the, uh, one of the product managers was heard to say, you know, traditionally what would happen is they'd come up with a great, an idea for some new feature. It's great. And they go to the developers and they say, we want to do this new feature. And they'd explain it and they go, uh, six weeks, two months maybe. Oh, no, that's too expensive. No, that's not worth it. That. We'll do, want to do something else. And that changed into, I've got this great idea for a feature. How about we do this? And the developers go, well, why do you want that? I mean, what's the point? We could do this, we could do that. We could do that in two days. How about that? And what he said in the end was that he'd go to the developers with a perfectly straightforward thing, and they'd be ask all these annoying questions, and it'd be, you know, make his life a misery. But he said it raised his game. It made him think about stuff that he'd never had to think about before. And I think that's the sort of thing that we need to, we need to encourage. And the, thing, the biggest thing we're at risk of losing with the way that, again, a certain kind of agile uh, happens. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>